Um, and this is the first installment of a series I haphazardly slash impromptuedly, which is totally a real adverb, uh, decided to start today. Uh, so for this VOD, we will be going over lessons in the fundamentals of Go. Um, and if you don't have a copy of the book, don't worry. Uh, if you join Twitch chat or whatever and exclaim Kageyama, you'll have a PD like a link to the PDF. Uh, and you can, you know, uh, read along or whatever whatever you'd like to do. <laughs> but yeah, uh, we're, it's considered a really important book. A lot of Go players will have read this book. Um, I admittedly, admittedly have not read it all the way through. Um, but yeah, so for example, Weichi Zed, who just commented, uh, they have it on a book display, and this is one's on the top shelf, and they, you know, yeah, feel free to read along. But uh, yeah, so today we'd like to go over the preface, introduction, and the first chapter. So yeah. And um, I will casually uh, be corresponding with chat too, so um, if you have to watch it at a different speed, this is your warning, but <laughs> okay. Oh wow, that is quite the note-taking, Wasif. Maybe not the greatest time to post this, but... Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no worries. I have no intention of, like, ignoring chat to make this. It's not like a, a fancy YouTube video, but... Um, yeah. We'll start with the lessons and the fundamentals of Go. Um, and I think I can make this single page, too. No, I cannot. Ah, uh, not what we wanted. Okay, it's fine. They'll be in two pages at a time. <laughs> you can clearly see how much I've uh, prepared for this. Kageyama? Yes, that is said author. Yes. It, it is really funny. It's really entertaining. Okay, so the preface. If you want to get stronger, read this book. Okay, so far so good. This call is addressed to a wide range of Go players, from beginners who have barely learned the rules to experts with Don rankings. Expert's a pretty strong word, I wouldn't call myself an expert, but anyway. In the following pages, I bequeath to the world the essence for of all the experience and knowledge that 7 years as an amateur and 22 more as a professional have given me. The book's main themes are the importance of fundamentals, the philosophy of Go, and how to study. All I ask is that the reader... Uh, not do anything so foolish as to finish it in one day. It should be read deliberately, a chapter at a chapter a day at the fastest, and a fortnight to finish the whole book. If the reader will then spend another fortnight rereading it and learning from it, as he would from a good instructor, I think I can promise that he will surmount the barrier of his present rank. Toshiro Kageyama, summer 1970. Um. 1970 yeah it's a pretty old book isn't it but uh ah um yes so reading my reading sucks yeah i mean you know uh my reading on the gobon sucks too but we'll, we'll figure it out or have it read to you exactly this is going to be like an audiobook vibe so we'll go over the table contents today we are going over chapter one ladder and nets Next week, perhaps, cutting and connecting, the stones go walking, the struggle to get ahead, territory and spheres of influence, lecturing on the NHK t television, life and death, how to study Joseki, good shape and bad, proper and improper moves, Tesuji, the snapback, shortage of liberties, the spiral ladder, the placement, the attachment, and under the stones, endgame pointers, and finally, a game commentary going over beating the Meijin. So chapter one, ladders and nets. <laughs> uh, I'm not, I'm not, I don't feel called out. You feel called out. <laughs> okay, introduction. The wish to become stronger, half a stone stronger, one stone stronger, is shared by all lovers of Go, amateur and professional, professional alike, regardless of the rank. It is the one manifestation of human spirit and ambition, which continue until death. There is a difference, however, between amateurs and professionals. To put it simply, amateurs play at the game, professionals labor at it. 
Once it was thought that this put amateurs and professionals on parallel tracks that never met, that amateurs could not even approach the professional level. Nowadays, however, the great surge in the size of the go-playing public has narrowed the distance between the tracks and even made them tangent. Already there are, among top class of amateurs, those who can acquit themselves quite well on even terms even against professionals. This serves to point out how Go is flourishing. So, um, I wish, right? Like, I mean, uh, the point about the tangent seems legit because, you know, now we have uh, AlphaGo, not AlphaGo, but like, you know, Lilo Zero and Katago and everything. And that that's a boon for sure. And like, you know, strong amateurs approach professional levels and they're tangential, sure. But if only there was a boon, not a boon, a boom of Go like there were in the 70s. Hey, Luxus, how are you? Yeah, I know, right? Telegraph flourishing. That's a sad, for sure. Wow, reading Go books makes me remember that I totally forgot to tell you that mine is out. No way! Oh my na! Yaksuk shitanoni. Um, it's in French though, right? Not that I'm complaining, I'll find someone to translate it. Transliterate it? No, we use the same alphabet, never mind. Um, but yeah, feel free to link it or whatever if you have a link or, you know, um... Or like if there's a paywall or if a journal published it or whatever, just link that too, you know. Um, but yeah, okay. But these are only a special few, chosen out of a mass of millions, almost like the rest seem to, uh, seem to remain far below where they would like to be, despite, despite their hardest efforts to improve. What should one do to become stronger at Go? This must be something that every Go enthusiast wants to know. I can recall many times that I have been asked this question. The real answer may, that, may be that there is no single definite answer. But saying that amounts to saying nothing. <laughs> I always wanted to answer the question. I always wanted to answer the question, but it seemed impossible to deal with it in a few words. I wanted to try writing a book, one about which I could boast, if you want to get stronger, read this. Now that I have the chance to do so, I am thrilled at the prospect of talking all of my own experience and distilling it into one volume to offer the world. <laughs> After you've learned the rules, your first step should be just to play for a while. And by a while, I'm not referring to any length of time, but rather a number of games, say 50 or 100. During this period, if you see an enemy stone, try to capture it, try to cut it off. If you see a friendly stone, try to save it from capture, try to connect it. Concentrate on this alone as you build up some practical experience. There is a saying about being tempered in a hundred battles. You cannot expect to do all your studying and gain all your knowledge from books. I would like to recommend that you play according to your own ideas with an open mind. If possible, choose other beginners as your opponents. If you are, a if you are to learn Go, open-mindedness is the most important thing. That's true. <laughs> Enabler guys, hi. Oh yeah, sorry Goshi. Um... What can I say? It's too it's too fun. Go is fun, but you know, we have to keep an open mind, not only on the Gobon, but off the Gobon too, right? Okay. Uh, next. Although it depends on the individual, in my experience you will encounter four barriers. At twelve to thirteen Q, at eight to nine Q, at four to five Q, and one to two Q. You are at a barrier where your strength ceases to rise and you find yourself playing for fun. As an exchange of ideas, any opponent will do. Studying books gets you nowhere. The thickness of these barriers varies from person to person. Some break through them easily, some do not. I know that there are many who spend morning to evening every day in Go Club playing tens of games a day, but make no progress. No matter how ardent their will to learn was at the beginning, let this condition continue for two to three months, not to mention one or two years, and hope is abandoned. The player comes to recognize himself as a permanent 6Q and everyone else does too. <laughs> this condition is unbearable, yet how many Go players find themselves in it? Almost all? If so, it would be a crime just to let them go on as they are. <laughs> and that is why I am writing this book, to explain in detail what is needed to break through those barriers. I feel that what I have to say will be most welcome news to those who do not know what to study or how to study it. Of course, one cannot make progress in any discipline without effort. There is no pleasure without pain. 
Pleasure is progress, and pain is the pain of effort. Study in the wrong way, however, and the result may just be pain with no pleasure at all. One must, without fail, learn the correct way to study. Ladders. Still on ladders? Ridiculous. Even looking at this page is beneath me. Yes, but even if you feel you're being cheated, read on a little further. Don't forget the fundamentals. Our study begins with ladders. And we see a, a traditional ladder starting position here with the move at one. Diagram one. Diagram one. The opening of an even game. The outcome of this game hangs on whether or not black can capture the white stone in the ladder that starts with one. Uh, many amateurs, sometimes even Don ranked amateurs, are apt to become impatient when confronted with long ladders, or short ladders, uh, like this, and resort to stooping down and sighting diagonally or running their fingers zigzag across the board, or, in extreme cases, to arguing their opponents into submission verbally. All of this I find a bit silly. When the ladder becomes slightly difficult like this, there is a widespread tendency to give up and wonder if there is not something like a triangle theorem, some mechanism one can apply and get the answer easily, instantly. If you want to create such a thing, it is not too much trouble to do some, but having it will only prove destructive to your game. Ladders should be the school that teaches you to read patiently, move by move, black, white, black, white, black, white which is the only way. Some will say, phooey, that much I know already, it's just that it's too much bother to actually do it. Others will say, look, I'm still weak at the game, I can't do anything difficult like reading. So much for these lazy students, let them do as they please, they're not going to get anywhere. They need to be grabbed by the scuff of the neck and have some sense knocked into them. Diagram 2 well then, how about this diagram? Can black capture the stone in a ladder? Without laying the stones on the board, can you follow this out? White, black, white, black, to the very end, by eye alone? What is your conclusion? The next diagram, diagram 3. Black grips the white stone, white escapes, black blocks in front of him, white escapes, black, white, black, white, black, and there! White loses 7 stones. See? You can read it! Look at diagram 2 once again. Black, white, black, white. You can read it. Again, do some repetition practice. When you feel secure, move the left hand bunch of black and white stones a line, or two lines, or three lines out diagonally. Read it again. Anyone whose eyes start to prickle or who gets a headache has a bad case of astigmatism and she see an optometrist at once. Confine your practice to this one exercise every day until you can read the long distance ladder in diagram 1 with the greatest of ease, right out to its end. When you can do that, rearrange the black and white stones in the lower left corner, use your ingenuity, and try reading again. That's the way. Okay. This exercise will earn you a valuable reward, the confidence that you can read any ladder anywhere anytime. This confidence heralds your next big stride. A great many people have broken through their barriers by sticking persistently to this method of mine. Habit is a frightening thing. Keep at it every day and soon the ladders that used to plague you will become the easiest things in the world to read out. You will not have the slightest difficulty reading out a straight ladder like the one in diagram 1 in a few seconds. A superhuman feat to anyone who does not know the game of Go, although a feat hardly worth mentioning to a professional. Even a beginner should be able to make short work of something like this. Let's go on. Diagram 4. Black to play. Obviously, if the ladder works, he should play at A. But what should he do when the ladder does not work? This may give one pause. Diagram 5. In certain circumstances, a shorter play like black 1 is effective, but here white comes out with 2 to 6, and black accomplishes nothing. Locally, one's first instinct is to jump out to black 1, but after white 2 to 6, black's 3 stones are in a very tight spot. This is no good either. So in diagram 7, let's look at the whole board. If the formation in the upper right corner occurred in this opening, what should black do? How about playing a ladder block at 1? Locally, at least, white has to defend at 2, 
And now the question is whether the ladder works or not. Well. Answer. Given the exchange of black 1 for white 2, black can capture white in a ladder. Naturally, black has to have anticipated white 2 and read out the ladder at 3 before he plays 1. Next, white shifts to 4, or to some such point. Here, black captures at 5. This is important. I imagine there are those who think black ought to wait until the ladder becomes broken and then capture, but uh, that is the shallow thinking of an amateur. Black 5 is the proper time to capture. To leave this move unplayed and turn elsewhere would be like trying to run a business while in debt. That would give me, at least, a very uneasy feeling. Of course, if you ask a person who is afraid of going into debt how... Uh, of course, if you ask how a person who is afraid of going into debt can run a business anyway, I will have to confess that I have very little experience in that line, so I cannot really say anything. So two things about that. Um, traditionally, yeah, you're supposed to capture ladder moves before they become an issue, like the Honte moves to capture. Um, but nowadays you might see variation on that, uh, especially with like AI. Uh, make no mistake, it cannot be considered a very bad move to capture the one stone. Um, and just because I have a background in business, just a wee bit, not that I'm any expert or anything, it's really common to run a business while in debt. Like it's like debt finance, financing, it might mess with your uh, ratios, like your leveraging in the future, but totally valid strategy, not to take away from anything. Um, I'm just, you know, taking a break from it. Um, false confidence, Sanj. <laughs> Imagine the, having the confidence to read ladders, can't relate. Imagine having the confidence to misread a ladder and think you hadn't misread it at all. It's not really like that. It's more like don't complain about reading when you have to read. If you're lazy and still want to get stronger, you're just a wishful thinker. Damn, Luxus. You're not even Asian, but you're ripping us a new one. <laughs> Boom, got him, amateurs. Hell yeah. In America especially, it seems running a business in debt is totally normal. It's like you're doing something wrong if you're not in debt. Well, I mean, it's not, it's not about, uh, well, in my opinion, anyway. Uh, it's not about geographical location. It's just about... You know, probably not the best idea to run like a sole proprietorship in debt or anything, but um, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, my child. Solid. Okay. Okay. Diagram 8. To go back to the moment when Black 1 def uh, definitely establishes the ladder, is there not the danger that White will ignore 1 and resist with 2? Depending on the situation, this is naturally a possible move. In this game, however, it is not one that white should adopt. Given black A, white B, black C, after white 2 and 4, black has decidedly the better position. Yeah, uh, cutting the camo in the corner is pretty significant. But if black were to switch and answer white 2 at D, letting white play at 3, he would have had his... Uh, his way in neither the upper right nor in the lower left corner. Irresolution is a vice. There are th various other things to be said about ladders, but the main point is that they branch into no variations, so don't be lazy, practice reading them. Occasionally, some periodical proudly announces that it has discovered a shortcut to reading ladders. Some worthless white elephant with four or five dotted diagonals and a heavy black lines. Even if you could understand it, it would not do your game the least good. Such things are ridiculous. One hardly ever hears of a professional misreading a ladder, but there was one famous tragic case around 1925, where one side misread a ladder in the opening, played it out for about three stones, realized his error, and resigned at barely the 30th move. Don't make light of ladders. Those who laugh at them will weep later. Next, I would like to show you an unusual game with simultaneous ladders. Diagram 9, in the next page. Perhaps you think that this sort of thing would never happen in a good game, and are wondering what kind of duffers <laughs> black and white were. But this sequence occurred in a game between Hosai Fujisawa Nindon, white, and Masao Sugiichi, um, Sugiichi Uchi, Nindon, black. 
It comes from the first Meijin League over a decade ago, uh, 1960s for reference. Imitative play, white two, etc., aka mirror ago, is Fujisawa's speciality, and it can lead to extraordinary things happenings like this, even at the highest professional levels. Of course, if one side could escape first and capture, then capture the other, he would win hands down. But it was because both sides had read out that this could not happen that the game ended up as shown. Since it is bad to chase the enemy in a ladder that does not work, we can understand、uh, Sugiyuchi's reasoning. When he escaped with White 37,、um, sorry, when he escaped with 37, White had chased him one stone farther with White 34, then he had chased the White group in the lower left. We can also understand the reasoning of Maya the Nindon, the observer, who pointed out that since White was able to start in first、uh, on the double Atari points like A, he was not necessarily worse off. At any rate, this game will probably go down in the annals of professional play as an all time freak. Diagram 10. This next curiosity is of a player deliberately chasing his opponent, not in a ladder that he had misread, but in a ladder he knew ahead of time would fail. It comes from the elimination rounds of the Nihon Kin Championship, January 1970. Kudo 8 Don, black, versus Kageyama 6 Don, white. My plan was to make use of white 1, etc., to live on the upper side. In a post game discussion that was joined by Rin Kaiho and others, it was decided that instead of white 1, just white 23, black 22, white 19, black 3, stopping the ladder. White 24, black 20, white 25, black 26, white 31 would have been a better way to live. I chose the latter sequence because it was unbranched, easy to understand, and left the lead unclear. But perhaps what was unclear was not so much the lead as my vision in judging it. I lost by resignation. No doubt the first requirement for becoming strong at Go is to like it, like it more than food or drink. And the second requirement is the desire to learn. A third requirement is to study it using proper methods, patiently, little by little, without cramming. Ask Don level amateurs, and you will find that they did not become stronger just by playing their opponents for fun. Each one kindled the desire to learn more, and put in no small amount of time studying. Each one will have had a few tales of hardship along the way to tell. Rome was not built in a day. It may take years of devoted study to the exclusion of all else. But it does take, it may not take years of devoted study to the exclusion of all else, but it does take effort piled upon effort to become strong at Go. The only ones who fall by the wayside are those, be they gifted or otherwise, who forget the word effort. Nets. What comes after ladders? Why? Nets, of course. What else? The two are like brothers, they are the basic ways of capturing stones. One of the precepts I always teach beginners is when it looks as if you can capture something, hold up two fingers and ask yourself two questions Can I catch it in a ladder? And can I catch it in a net? The Japanese term for ladder is shicho, which is a slurring of the original shitsuyo n i o u meaning pursue doggedly. The origin of the Japanese term for a net, geta. Takes a well fortified imagination to understand. Literally, geta means wooden clog, a common type of footwear in Japan. And if you can see that in the four black stones in diagram one,、uh, then white's triangle stone becomes the foot, and black one the thong that keeps the foot from escaping. Playing one completes the picture of the geta. These are my own private etymologies for the two terms, but don't you agree that they fit quite Diagram 1. I dare say everyone would play black 1 in diagram 1 and capture the stone by netting it. Another possibility would be to capture it in a ladder if the ladder was working. That would do the job, but sooner or later, black would have to play another stone and capture it completely, or else face a ladder block. In other words, the net captures with one stone where the ladder would require two. That is the main reason why nets are better than ladders. Next, I would like to show you an example of a net from actual play. In 1966, I became the final recipient of the Takam- Takamatsu no Miya Prize. 
I had White in the deciding game against T Kajiwara and countered his Taisha Joseki opening with the new move. Damn. Diagram 2. Kajiwara followed one of his favorite variations from Black 7 to the extension of 17. I answered by departing from the Joseki A at 20 and trotting out my new Hane at 22. The next day, I discussed this move with T. Yamabe, 9 Don. Yamabe, how could anybody be so dumb as to Hane at 22 and let Black extend to a point like 23? And whatever possessed you to ignore all this and play White 24? All I can say is I'm astounded at you. He and I have always been on informal terms, and he always speaks bluntly, even if I do not. Kageyama. I thought I was getting a pretty good result when I played 26, White 26, and Hashimoto, Utaro of the Kansai Kin, genuinely admired my moves. Yamabe. That just proves you can't tell when he's being sarcastic. And speaking of White 26, that narrow extension was too miserable for words. Once you let Black take a prime point like 23, the game is over. There's no question about it. I know Kajiwara lost, but the way you play is so asinine that it makes your opponents lightheaded, that's all. Now that I set these words down on paper and reread them, they sound almost insulting, so let me make it clear for the sake of the art, strong and outspoken language, which makes a deep impression, is most welcome. Even though there may have been an element of insult present, and, here, and the hearer definitely did not feel insulted. When I asked Kojima 6 Dan and Yokoyama 5 Dan, they agreed that White 22 was bad, because of Black, Black 23. My proudly played new move was getting a poor reception at all sides. The next day, however, uh, Sugiyuchi Nindon described White 22 to 26 in the Go column of the Tokyo newspaper as a new pattern that gives a fair result. This was more like it. My sinking spirits revived a little. How can professionals have such wildly differing views? It comes from two different ways of looking at the game. The intuitive approach and the profit approach. Professionals in particular tend to stress the intuitive approach at the expense of the other, which may be the only natural, which may be only natural since it is the intuitive players who usually have in them some spark of genius. To these intuitionists, players like me, whose fortes are the diagonal move, the hane, and the connection, must seem like the bottom of the heap, and this too may be only natural. For some reason, Sugiyuchi, on more than one occasion, has expressed a high opinion of my game. Interesting openings, powerful, clear judgment, and artistry of the highest caliber are the words in which he has extolled it. If anyone else said it, I would think he is joking, but Sugiyuchi, the god of Go, is so straight-laced that I am not sure what to think. Listen to him continue. You ought to have more confidence in yourself, Kageyama. It's a pity your momentary lapses of confidence keep letting you down. I'm definitely not trying to belittle myself, but almost everyone, including me, regards me as some kind of slow-witted, overgrown amateur. The thought that at least one of my superiors sees some promise in me makes me take heart and face tomorrow with the determination to do my best. I've gotten off subject. To return, Diagram 3, next page. Black 1 epitomizes a net. This one move ends all chances for the three white stones to escape. Why Nakamutsu, 5 Dan, uh, Nakamatsu, 5 Dan, a top ranking amateur, however, made the following comment. I don't know what a beginner would think, but I feel it is, I feel, the way I feel is that Black 1 is too tight. White has forcing moves at A, B, and so on. Isn't it a bit hard to take? Black ought to play 1 at A at least. Black 1 or Black A? Which do you prefer? I put this question to every Don rank amateur I met for a while, and almost everybody answered A. What about professionals? They held Black 1 to be so natural and obvious that the question was not even worth discussing. I found this extremely interesting. A beginner would probably play Black 1 in high spirits, rejoicing at having found some way to capture the three white stones. That is, the beginner's move would be the same as the professional's, although they would be thinking differently. A stronger amateur would just glare at the position and play black A for a larger capture. 
A professional, however, would find the threat of white C, after black A, disquieting, regardless of whether or not it works immediately. To him, black one would be the natural and proper move, the only move to make. Black one or black A? Only an amateur would ask himself this question. Neither their intuitive school nor the prophet school would give it a second thought. Here we can see another difference between amateur and professional. And that is what I say now, but what was I thinking during the game? To be honest, I was expecting black to play at A, which means that if it had been me, I might have played at A myself. I even feel a little grateful to Kajiwara for playing black one. At the t as time went on, however, I began to realize the virtues of black one. Faithfulness to the fundamentals is something that becomes second nature to a pro professional. Call it a matter of training, if you will, but what changed me from an amateur into a professional was getting a really firm grip on the fundamentals. Yet here I am, 20 th years later, and I still have not acquired this one fundamental. The amateurist professional. That's my other name. I'm not bragging about this or feeling smug. I want to become a professional professional, even if it takes the rest of my life. Diagram 4. Black, for whom the ladder is on, is asking himself, should I grip the white stone with A or not? Let's answer him. If you play A, you'll have to add another stone at B. If you can finish capturing white with one move, why look for anything better? Diagram 5. Correct variation. Black nets white with one, white two, etc. Uh redoing that. Diagram 5, the correct variation. Black nets white with 1. White 2, etc. show that its escape is impossible. Black 1 captures white with one move, that is. It is more efficient than black A in the previous diagram. This is the main reason it is correct. Neither this diagram nor diagram 3 look very much like a wooden clog, so my etymology for the term geta begins to seem suspect. Or sus. Surely it did not come from English, a play on the phrase get her. <laughs> what? But K. Kodama, 5 Don, has the theory that it derived from a similar witticism in Japanese, and he is probably right. Diagram 1, or er, Diagram 6, Problem 1. Black to play. What should he do? Diagram 7. I dare say this will be the most common answer. Diagram 7. I dare say this will be the most common answer. You mean it's wrong? That's right, and it's wrong. Look, you can't be trying to tell me to capture the stone in a ladder. God forbid the thought, but look at diagram 8. You have this option here too. It's the kind of move that's easy to overlook. Diagram 8. The Atari at 1 is the correct answer. If white comes out at A, black nets him with B. Of course, black 1 in diagram 7 captures white just as surely, but when there are two ways to capture with one move, the firmer way is correct. It's worth reflecting upon the value of the firmness of black 1 in diagram 8. Diagram 9, problem 2. Black to play. Should he capture with A or B? Both plays do the job in one move, but one is quite clearly better than the other. The correct answer is black A. If white tries to get out, black can net them. And if white tries to keeps trying to get out, black has the squeezing scene Tetsuji. Uh, the reason black A is better than black B is the same as in the previous problem. Diagram 10, problem 3. Black to play. How should they capture the uh, two white stones? If you got the first two problem right, and slip up on this one, you do not really understand the first two, for this is just an application of them. The answer is restricted to two points, A and B. Which? The answer is A. If white tries to escape at C, black stops them at D. Diagram 11, problem 4. Can black capture the 
triangle stone. <laughs> Diagram 12, problem 5. Black to play. Can they capture the three white stones? We are getting into difficult terrain now, but even a beginner should not give up. Read it out move by move to the end. That is the only way. If you cannot guess even the first move, then, well... <clears throat> Diagram 13 Black 1 and 3 are good style, but they are the wrong answer to problem 4. In this particular case, after the 4 sequence to white's connection at 14, black is faced with both A and B, so their result is unfavorable. Diagram 14 This black 1, the correct answer, is an interesting net to Suji. One that even white might overlook. If white plays A, black gives way with B. This contradicts common sense, which would dictate blocking at the point below A, but black has read it out. Next, if white plays C, black can capture them with D. Diagram 15. Black 1 and so on, which are the answer to problem 5, have to be thoroughly read out through the next diagram, diagram 16, before black can play them. If white keeps trying to escape, black holds them fast with the sequence up to 8. It almost takes 20 moves but ends in white's utter defeat. Were you able to read this out? <laughs> when it looks as if you can capture something, hold up two fingers and ask yourself, can I catch it in a net? Can I catch it in a ladder? This is one of the first things taught in a beginner's manual, but that does not make, mean that a stronger player can afford to forget it. The reason that so many people never master this elementary skill is that they keep ignoring it as being beneath them. They are the people who cannot be bothered to read, who just try to capture the uncapturable group because it looks as if it can be done, or because they figure they can muddle through somehow, and so they rush headlong into disaster. They're also the people who, when they try to, when they face a slightly stronger opponent, do not try to capture the capturable group, because with their fuzzy reading they're afraid of messing it up, who innocently add unnecessary stones to their already alive groups, who take fright without cause, who tremble when they sit down at the go board, who play through the whole game with a sullen expression, who lose every fight, who eventually come to hate go. Sorry wretches. Through, through choice, they have abandoned the most interesting and enjoyable of all games. No matter what age they are, a person's brain cells are sharpened and work better the more they use them. Go is a perfect mental exercise. It is worth a few leisure moments. Think of it, as you, if you like, as the game that prevents brain degeneration. And with that, uh, that concludes the preface and chapter one of Kageyama's Fundamentals of Go. Um, I hope to catch you back here next time for the next installment, chapter two, Cutting and Connecting. <laughs>